Hello, I'm Bryony Worthington and this is Cleaning Up. One of the challenges in getting to net zero is how to replace fossil fuels burned to generate heat. Currently, the dominant provider in the UK and in many countries is fossil gas, distributed to individual homes via networks of pipes and burned in boilers. There's currently a fierce debate about whether the replacement for this greenhouse gas-laden sector should be a substitute fuel or a shift to electric heating, most efficiently through the use of heat pumps. Heat pumps are essentially refrigerators operating in reverse, using electricity to extract heat from the air or the ground and boost it to the temperatures we need to keep our homes snug in winter and, as an added bonus, cool in summer. My guest this week is Tamsin Lishman, newly appointed CEO of UK company Kenza Group, Tamsin leads an experienced team of engineers, product designers and project developers focused on scaling the heat pump market. I wanted to ask Tamsin about Kenza's networked ground source heat pump solution, their goals as a company and also about being a female leader in the traditionally male-dominated energy sector. Sadly, there is some background noise as we were recording in central London, but to compensate, viewers of our YouTube channel can enjoy some images of Kenza's products. Please join me in welcoming Tamsin Lishman to Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe and leave a review and tell all your friends about us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favourite podcast platform and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn or Instagram. Over the holidays, we moved the Cleaning Up newsletter to Substack where you can find it on mlcleaningup.substack.com. That's mlcleaningup.substack.com. And don't forget, there are over 170 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders on cleaningup.live. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, as well as by the Liebreich Foundation, the Gilardini Foundation, and our newest supporter, Ecopragma Capital. Tamsin, welcome to Cleaning Up. It's uh, very pleased to see you and nice to be in person. Um, I'm going to start off by asking the obvious question, which is, could you introduce yourself using your own words and tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got here? Yeah, so Tamsin Lishman, I am the CEO of Kenza Group. And what Kenza Group, our mission is to decarbonize heat at scale using network heat pumps, so that's white heating box in people's homes, connected to pipes in the ground that take that warmth from the ground that comes from the sun and then boost that to heat people's homes. And I would describe myself as a, you know, passionate about decarbonizing heat and a practitioner in the energy transition. That's wonderful. And you're a newly appointed CEO. Yes. So how long have you been in post? So I've been in post since October. Um, so I think what four months um, and that feels inevitable when you're doing something you love with an amazing team feels like I've been there for years amazing and so tell us a little bit about the path to then taking over as CEO of Kenza what were you doing before so before Kenza I worked in another heat decarbonization scale up looking at industrial decarbonization and then before that I did a, a variety of senior roles in running energy generation businesses in the water industry um, and general energy banking. So my my background is really a combination of strategic partnerships, how to grow businesses and commercial business models, running big, complex operational businesses and building great teams. And that's what I really love doing and solving difficult problems. And so just because let's just dig into a bit to Kenza then. So I first came across Kenza, I think I was in the House of Lords working on an energy bill, and one of the board members mentioned it to me, and I had not heard of it. Of course, then found out about it and thought, oh, wow, another brilliant little jewel in the British crown of energy transition companies. But I felt it had quite a low profile. But tell us us a little bit about where Kenza is today and and, and what, what you're actually currently doing today. Yeah, so where Kenza is today, we've just got investment last year from Legal and General and Octopus that helps us scale. And so our mission is to grow to 10 times our current size in the next five years, creating one and a half thousand jobs ourselves, decarbonizing big chunks of the UK's heat and implementing area by area, street by street decarbonization, where 
residents can sign up, have a white box of their choice fitted by their own plumber in their house with the electricity supplied of their voice, choice, pay a small standing charge to Kenza and keep their house cosy and warm and cool in summer using ground source uh, cooling as well. So let's just think, talk a little bit about ground source um, heat pumps because heat pumps aren't that well known. And if they are known, it's mostly the air source heat pumps, which are the kind of refrigerant-like units on the sides of houses. But but the ground source that you do is a network scale. So you want to just describe it to us? Yes. So we do network heat pumps, which is shared boreholes, so holes into the ground and then shared pipes that then connect to individual people's homes. Why do we do that? Ground source heat pumps are the most efficient so they use 40% less electricity in typically than an air source heat pump. And that means over the life cycle of the, the heat pump, they usually have about 20% lower life cycle costs. So they're better for consumers and better for the electricity grid because they use less energy. And um, what they do is take that heat from the earth. So the ground is always around 10 to 15 degrees throughout the year. Take that heat then into the heat pump and the heat pump then transfers that to a gas, boosts that heat using a compressor, exactly like the reverse of our fridges. Mm -hmm. And then that heat then can heat our hot water and our heating in our homes. Um, so very simple. The technology is designed to be very simple, very robust, long lasting, and really quite boring. Um, <laughs> which well, we is like good. Bo boring we is like good, boring. right. And so, so the components are, you're drilling down to a certain yes. depth and then you're installing a pipe that's, that's collecting right. the heat from, from the ground, as you that's say. Right. Ultimately, the ground stays at a nice level temperature throughout the year. And then you're using a unit within the home to compress that and boost it up to the levels that's that... Right. Okay. A unit within the home and again, ground source heat pumps can be in a cupboard, under the stairs, exactly where we have our boilers today. Right, and you actually call them your shoebox, don't you? Because they're That's quite right. compact. So our product's called the shoebox, and it is the size of a microwave, so it goes in a kitchen cupboard. So very compact. And and then let's just talk about Ken's of the business then. So you're a manufacturer and a developer, a project developer, installer? That's right. Or? So we're three things. We manufacture heat pumps, we install them at scale, and then with the support of Oxus and LNG, we fund them. So we take away that barrier, which is the, the higher upfront cost. So we fund the ground arrays. And then we allow consumers to pay a small standing charge, exactly like they do for gas and electricity today. So we do the end-to-end, -end, the whole system. And that's actually something we think is really important, is our knowledge about from borehole to radiator, how we keep homes cozy and warm in summer and cool, so again, warm in winter and cool in summer. Yeah, which is an added bonus, right, yeah. that, that the current gas boiler doesn't provide, right? We all love our gas boilers, don't we, really? But in the summer, they're not very useful, whereas yeah. this little white box does both. Yes, yeah, so this little, this, well, actually it's not the white box, but it's the ground array, can then also provide cooling in summer. So taking that excess heat, finding cool to home, putting it in the ground, and it has the added benefit of warming the ground and then making it actually more efficient in winter. So that cooling in summer makes the reduces costs in winter for people. So there's a real win-win-win. And the other thing that I think is exciting about this is that just in terms of energy balances, so you're taking electricity from the grid, putting one unit of electricity in for about four units of usable heat. So it's Incredibly efficient. So incredibly efficient. And then again, we've got work that we're working on to create also then the ability to use demand side response and more flexibility. So today there's flexibility inherently in using a heat pump and we're looking at having right over 24 hours flex thermal storage flexibility. So really then allowing us to optimize how we take electricity from the grid to support lowest cost of generation, lowest cost of transmission upgrades. And what we did with Element Energy last year showed that there's an opportunity of up to 23% lower cost of electricity transmission and generation through using ground source heat pumps. Mm. That's matched by the Department of Energy in the US who published a study saying there's an opportunity for 38% lower electricity transmission upgrade using ground source heat pumps. So really big system opportunity. Yeah through that efficiency. And we imagine those cold days like we had last, we've had recently, those cold days in winter where everyone wants a cosy house. Mm. How do we make sure we've got the lowest 
demand on the electricity grid overall. And that's where the ground really comes into its own because just below the surface, very still, little changes. Yeah, temperatures still 10 to 15 yeah, degrees. Exactly. Yeah. Now, it all sounds amazing. And I suppose one of the challenges that we have is that people's understanding of the efficiency gains, like a systems level, perhaps isn't quite there, is it? And one of the regular listeners to Michael's podcast will know that one of the things that we're competing against at the moment is this idea that we might perhaps use a like-for-like like fuel, say, for example, hydrogen, which isn't quite a like-for-like, like, but um, and, and that sort of idea that we might just reuse the gas network and put a different fuel into it does seem to be causing a bit of confusion. But unlike the heat pumps, instead of getting a big efficiency gain, you're getting an actual efficiency penalty, uh, which is it's much less efficient to create the hydrogen than the natural gas. So how are we going to communicate this to people so that it's really clear to understand that one option is efficient and, and clean, and the other option is you know actually going to add to our overall energy needs? Yes. It's a great question because I think, you know, this is it. Why are heat pumps so attractive is because you put one unit of energy in and for us, four units of heat out. And that's our experience is actually we've done uh, recently 273 tower blocks in Thurrock. And there the residents have been able to drop their energy bills. Actually, they've dropped, they've, they've chosen more comfort, interestingly. So, but their energy bills have halved. So that's allowing people to have, in, and this is in social housing, much more choice over how they spend their money and more comfort. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, this is, this is very much how do we communicate it and a bit of why am I here and what's important to us is sharing that there is heat pumps are a solution, but also most importantly for us, networked heat pumps, ground source heat pumps done at scale are a critical part of the pathway to decarbonize heat. They're a solution for area you know, street by street, area by area decarbonisation with pipes in the ground and then allowing consumers to choose as and when they want to sign up or not. So again, really mirroring the gas grid today or how we heat our homes today. A white box of our choice, providing hot water and heating in a cupboard that we choose, connecting to pipes in the street funded by institutional investors, a small standing charge and our own choice of then the electricity you know, user we do. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to us. I think, you know, we actually are quite encouraged what we see as the the sort of the death throes of perhaps alternative heating, but there's still some way to go. And we see this opportunity about using the most efficient form of heating as mm -hmm. really being important to get, um, you know, get into the, get, make sure it's part of the toolkit mm -hmm. of policymakers, local authorities, you know, and consumers that uh, this this is going to be a, an e ease ease of switch, and again, our whole mission is how do we through scaling we can bring our cost base down by sixty percent, and so the mission our mission is to make it no more expensive, ideally cheaper for consumers to heat their homes with a ground source heat pump as a gas boiler. Maybe not today, but traditionally. Yeah, and and I, I guess at the moment there are two barriers. One is the upfront capital. Um, and then there's the fact that electricity generally is a bit more expensive. But but as you say, you're using a quarter of the electricity you hope to get. So the, the upfront capital, I mean, this is something there there are billions of pounds of investor money ready to be deployed. And that ability to deploy institutional investors into the into the infrastructure, exactly like we do in many things, actually for me isn't a barrier, but more around the policy signals and the confidence in the business model. Mm -hmm. um, but there is no shortage of investment ready to be deployed. And certainly, you know, we've got billions of pounds ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, the electricity, yes. I mean, it, it seems in a world where we're looking to decarbonize heat and support electrification in, in the home, that we put increased taxes on electricity rather than gas and so create perverse incentives. And I think, you know, it's encouraging to see the focus on that, but anything we can do to support using electricity in the most efficient way for heating clearly is a good thing. Yeah. And it, just going back to the point you made about the fact that this is quite similar to how the gas networks were rolled out, right? It's an, in, an infrastructure that's invested in. And then the consumers, presumably if you're taking a sort of average street, you, you need about half of them. That's right. We would look for about half to sign up, very similar to fibre rollout, half mm -hmm. to sign up up front and then we're confident that as people see 
their neighbour and the comfort it's providing or their gas boilers ready to be replaced, that again, other other um, residents will then sign up. Mm-hmm. But it isn't then, uh, you know, what can feel for people like that scary mandate, you must on a date change. We really believe in the importance of consumer choice yeah. and giving wow. the best experience, making it easier, as it easier and cheaper. That's that's everything. How do we make it easier and cheaper? Yeah. And, and again, for those who've been following Michael's work and the work of this podcast, you, they, people may know that um, one uh, kind of, almost cul-de-sac the government was driving this policy down was to mandate that everyone should replace their gas boilers at a village scale with hydrogen boilers and a hydrogen network and it, it made it, it they seem to do it all wrong I, I, I don't know who's to blame whether it was the local government the government national government all the, the gas distribution companies who've given the task but the trials that were you know suggested have both fallen over because of lack of public buy in yeah. so i guess you're learning from all of that and thinking how do we make sure we do it much better yeah so kenza's a 25 year old company and has been installing network heat pumps so ground source heat pumps in people's homes for over 10 years so actually we've got a lot of experience of how do we take residents and our customers through that journey of retrofitting their heating. We have a project in Cornwall and St. Stephen's called Heat the Streets, where we've done a mass retrofit of, um, of the part of the village, five times oversubscribed. And again, there, that's heat, the um, pipes in the ground funded by institutional investors and, and actually, in this case, EU money and then heat pumps. So we've actually got a lot of experience of how do we take people on that journey of what's, what's a ground source heat pump, how will it do... And we really pride ourselves in that ongoing customer support and keeping people cozy. This is kind of the heart of Kenza. Uh, one of our phrases, we do the right thing, even if it's difficult. And that's the sort of ongoing. So so that's something, I'm, and clearly we have more to do, but that bit about how do we work with people to make sure they're confident and comfortable mm-hmm. and that their home's going to be warm. So given what you just said about being a 25-year-old company, why is it that... No one's heard of you. I mean, yeah. honestly, you know, you've been sort of doing this great work, but you're not visible that I've seen sort of in the corridors of Westminster. So tell us a little bit about what you want to do in that respect. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is now we're in this new, I call it new phase of heat. 2024 is the year of heat. And I think we're seeing one heat decarbonisation much more in the public domain and the policy domain. And this is partly, you know, what what the role of me and the rest of my team is how do we share this you know, incredible opportunity for how do we decarbonize in the most efficient way, in the way that's best for consumers, so people know know what we do. And again, one of my you know one of my areas of you know op- it's an opportunity and threat, isn't it? But the threat is no one knows about network heat pumps; they're missed, and we end up with an approach that is more expensive and less fair for consumers. Um, and that really, you know, it, it drives us in a, you know, the company's very purpose-led and we're all very purpose-led. It really drives us to why we do it. So, yes, I, and I think, you know, we welcome all the sort of suggestions of how can we do more and get this on the on the radar of government policymakers and consumers. Great. Well, I think one of the things is, because you're, you're based in Cornwall, is that right? We're based in Cornwall, yeah. although the, the he, we're headquartered in Cornwall and we're at a heart of Cornish company, but actually we're a UK company. And our, you know, where where homes are and where people live, yeah. and so that means we have a UK wide spread and people in Kenza all across the UK. Right. We need to see more of you, I think, in uh, in 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 in, in yeah. sort of Whitehall and Westminster, because it, you know, my experience is part of politics is just who shows up, and at the moment there are a lot of lobbies showing up with their solutions, and I think it does it inevitably just distorts people's yeah. awareness if if you know all they ever hear about is hydrogen ready boilers or whatever. So yeah, hopefully you'll have the time to be come up here more often and yes, sell the story. And thank you for the tip. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. So turning then to um, policy, right? Yes. So. It is, you know, a sector which is you know, regulated. We have a we have a price regulator. We have government policies all over the place. You know, trying to guide capital into the right solutions. So, tell me about the policies that you're watching that are going to hopefully help. So, there are a number of really important policies for us. Um, one of them is heat network zoning, and this is the one where it's, we believe it's really important. Network heat pumps are part of the toolkit, part of the solution for heat networks. So this is where we'll designate part of cities and towns to have heat networks. 
And that can be a number of different solutions. At a, at a local level, city a, level. A, a city or area, area so this is city at local level, planning level. Local planning level. Um, and network heat pumps are the most efficient form of heat network for what we call mid-density housing. What does that mean in reality? Terrace streets, blocks of flats, the kind of three high blocks of flats. So if we all picture those really, really dense big city centres, centralised plants best there. And we really... A centralised plant meaning... uh, A a centralised air source or some other form of centralised plant. It has been... um, so uh, with then pipes carrying hot water to But this is homes. just for the sort of five, five stories up kind of five tower. Five stories really up, dense. really dense yeah. city centre, right at the heart. So if we imagine Bristol, just that very tight inner ring. Very quickly, we get into what um, what site of mid-density housing, terrace houses, blocks of flats, f- flats, um, that makes up about 50% of the UK's housing stock. Mm-hmm. And their network heat pumps are more efficient because the efficiency of the heat pumps more than you know and and is more effective than the hot water pipes which have then the heat losses kick in um so for us heat network zoning really important network heat pumps are part of the toolkit and part of the solution set so do you need a positive designation or do you just need permissive we just need to make sure in the uh that it's part of the solution set um and that gives you then an ability to act like a utility in terms of exactly. drilling into streets. Drilling and into streets, being able to bid into um, areas to be, uh, and also for then decision makers to understand the, the relative choices and the relative benefits to consumers. Okay. But it, would there be, an, I mean, there's a lot of local authorities to cover. Is there a national policy guideline that could yes. help as well? Yes. So, so there's a national policy guideline. There's been one that's rolled out in Scotland. It misses network heat pumps. So that's an area of concern for us at the moment. There's consultation going on across England and Wales. And this is where, for us, we really want network heat pumps to be just part of those guidelines, part of the awareness as local authorities, their advisors, various other people doing it, that this is part of the solution set. And to be able to, so that's really important to us. Then the other things in the policy landscape that are very important. The future home standard that supports decarbonisation of heat and new build. And so this is a government policy that guides the building industry as to what they should build and what the standards the houses should exactly. reach. Exactly, okay. standards reach. And so that supports electrification of heat in new build housing. And there actually we've been able to develop an offer for new build developers about ground source for them for less or the same as the cost of air source. So better for the developer and then lower costs for the inhabitants of those houses, the end customer, because of the efficiency. Mm-hmm. So we're really excited about the opportunity in new build that then gives us that ability to scale. And again, the system benefit that lower electricity demand then allows new build developers to unlock sites that might otherwise have issues with grid capacity. Yes, um, because you're not requiring a huge new line exactly. to go in just for the heating. So those are two. Um, then there's the clean heat mechanism, which again is a, a effectively a, a, a sort of trading mechanism around where heat pump, um, there's a sort of token for every heat pump sold that people who are selling gas boilers then need to have. So that again that supports, it makes it makes heat pumps cheaper for consumers. Yes. So we're, we're actually doing this interview in a location called Sustainable Ventures in London, just over the road from Westminster. And there are groups here who've worked on a similar policy for transport. the zero emissions vehicles standard, as it's called, which is basically what's made it possible for investors to come in and provide electrification of transport services, whether it's the cars or the charge points. And, and that policy has just come into law in January of this year. And really what my understanding of the clean heat mechanism is this is the sort of equivalent for heat. It, it asks the current incumbents who are currently happily providing customers with boilers to diversify into clean yes. and they but they can trade can't they That's if they right. can't meet their quota they, they trade. trade and so what it means is that effectively that allows and again it's another way of reducing that upfront cost for people to switch to heat pumps including ground source heat pumps and it based very importantly breaks open the market in the sense open of the market, yeah exactly so but when what's the status of that policy 
Goodness me, um, I feel like I need my, my policy director here. I think it's in development, you know, and I think what we're seeing is now that's starting to be factored into the consumer offers. And we're really excited about that. You know, for us, anything that makes it better for consumers, cheaper, you know, and less of a barrier to switching is a good thing. Right, good. So I, I feel like I need you. Well, know, we, we, in our notes to the show, we'll, we'll find out exactly what status that policy, because that policy does seem like the in, yeah. the financial incentive that could make that's a difference. Right. Yeah. And, um, and is there anything else? There are some yeah, more. What it's else? an exciting answer. So then there are also in the in the public sector space, there's the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund and public sector. And those are really important about in social housing, taking people out of fuel poverty and decarbonising heat. So an example is there's around 4,000 electrically heated tower blocks in the UK. So these are people who use night storage heaters. We've just seen that the cost of the electricity to those is going off. And those are, in our words, a no-brainer to then change to ground source heat pumps, reduce people's costs substantially. And again, what, what's important to Kenza is that we look at decarbonisation in the round in the most effective way. And it has traditionally feel, seemed or been very focused on fabric. And I think, you know, we always advocate you should do the most cost-effective things and fabric's important. But then we need also to look at other solutions like networked heat pumps. Yeah. So in a sense, what you're saying is, you know, the focus has been on the fabric of the building, the kind of the walls, the, the, yeah. the windows, the, the roof. But actually, the real emissions are coming from the, the heat source, the fuel that's being burned. And more focus on that within, within the fo- sector would... More focus on that and looking at the most cost effective form of decarbonisation. Yeah, because actually... If you're reducing the, the you're, in, you're basically increasing the efficiency of the actual heat provision, right. then it takes the emphasis off a little bit, the fabric of the building, which we know traditionally in Britain is, is difficult, right? We've got all of these yeah. period homes and retrofitting yeah. has proved to be quite yeah. troublesome. Yes. Yeah. Um, Can I ask you about um, business uh, solutions? Because yes. um, obviously your technology is focused mostly on that, you know, 50% of homes in Britain that could benefit, but there's a lot of commercial heat and cooling particularly are you focused on that we absolutely are and actually yesterday i went to see one of the projects we're doing at a a a period conference venue and wedding venue um, in warrington so very much and an important part if i come back to our strategy area by area that opportunity to decarbonize um, supermarkets schools office buildings swimming pools in an area and there's a lovely um, sort of efficiency improvement where the if we provide cooling to a supermarket, that heat then makes it more efficient and so more cost effective for the local inhabitants nearby. Mm-hmm. So it's a really important part of our strategy. We do some important work in what we call non-domestic, so not non, um, including some schools, as I say, this wedding conference venue, swimming pools, fire stations. So yes, it's a really important part, again, of decarbonising heat. Mm-hmm. And then so turning back to sort of uh, your role then, uh, how because the potential for this to scale seems very high, if we can get clarity, if we can get clarity that one of the routes to decarbonising heat is clearly a winner in efficiency terms and cost and, and comfort. Um, so let's assume the politicians will you know, wake up yeah. and realise that's the case and then put the policies in place. How are you going to scale your, your enterprise? So if I describe various parts of my role, one part is how do we get the message out there? Then sec- a second really important part is like, what's that business model? It's very important to have offers that are competitive, better than the next best alternative. And so working again to make sure we've got really compelling offers. So we're really proud of what we've done in the new build space and how do we continue to make that? So it's the best thing for people to do. Then working my team at how do we scale up both our own internal, you know, the great people we've got, but recruiting, growing. How do we move from doing 100 projects a year to a 1,000, and then building the partnerships in the supply chain. We're not going to do all of this ourselves. So if we think about what's the partnership in with someone who does utilities today in doing uh, putting pipes in the street, what's yeah. the what are the different things? So that bit, how do we how do we scale? And then the really important part of the part of my role is how do we take people on this journey and mm-hmm. keep that you know keep that purpose, that teamwork, that ambition, 
and that kind of entrepreneurial spirit alive. And and so, if, for example, you've got a manufacturing uh, facility. Yes. Um, that's in Cornwall. That's in Cornwall. And but you, your supply chain isn't particularly complicated, is it? You, you, the inputs are standard. No. So if we take our supply chain, so the inputs that go into our heat pumps are used in many, many different settings, including fridges. So there, there is a widely available supply chain. Our factory has capability to scale, and then we can replicate our factory. So it's sort of cookie cutter. We can replicate it as the market grows. Mm-hmm. The next bit of our supply chains, and when we install them, drilling, and that is a bespoke part of ground source heat pumps. There's some very strong companies in this space, and again, that will be where we look about how do we how do we work together to grow. Then it's putting uh, digging temporary holes in the street and putting pipes in, which is a widely available skill. And then the installation. Um, one of the things that, that's really great about the Kenza heat pumps is they can be installed by any competent plumber. And this started from the origin where the company was small and couldn't go, the, the small team couldn't drive around the whole of the UK installing them. So it's designed to be installed by any plumber without retraining. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of work about ta- um, supporting plumbers in it's not a retraining, but just the confidence in installing those whether it's in new build housing, individual people's houses. Mm-hmm. So again, there's, there's, they're in this and we, we've done a, a back of the envelope calculation that roughly 98 pence in every pound spent on a Kenza ground source heat pump will be u- recycled within the UK economy. So oh. that green skills, you know, green jobs multiplier mm. and the just transition, I think, is really important to us. Yeah. So you touched on something there, which is really interesting. It, Kenza has all the hallmarks to me of a classically engineering led Brilliant little company, but um, you know, so I don't mean yeah. that to sound patronising, but you know, with huge potential to scale, but um, facing some t- fairly stiff headwinds because you've got an incumbency who are currently very happily providing people with gas into their homes, and the challenges to sort of get you noticed, and and then also I guess find the right partnerships. And tell me a little bit about how the Octopus and Legal and General partnership came about because they're, they're quite, well, certainly Octopus is a new entrant, which is always yeah. exciting. So Legal and General first invested in Kenzo in 2020 and then have invested more in the latest funding round. And it's a very good... And for, for non-UK people, listeners, um, Legal and General is an insurance. It's an insurance company who also have uh, their own um, Legal and General capital where they invest in things like affordable build to rent, um, and um, various uh, parts of the housing market and energy transition, but very much around decarbonisation and affordable homes. So aligned with their mission. Very much aligned okay. with their mission. Um, so with them, you know, that first investment and then investing more, again, being able to work closely in partnership, we've installed ground source heat pumps in one of their company's inspired villages who've launched the first net zero retirement village. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, again, that, that opportunity to work together. And if I take that, it's a lovely example of, you know, when you get real partnerships, you can look at where's the value creation together? How do we unlock that issue on grid capacity constraints? How can we optimize with maybe solar PV and the ground source heat pump and look for that mutual rather than maybe a more traditional, you know, client can, you know, client contractor relationship. Yeah. So that's that's League in general. And then Octopus came in last year and bring in as well as the investment that deep expertise into the consumer the energy transition and lots of opportunity again for us to work together on how do we create that consumer offer but also create value from flexibility yeah. so we're we're very very excited about our you know the, that partnership that brings more than money mm. um, well it's interesting because you know octopus are new entrants onto yeah. the scene and that have been you know incredibly successful at establishing themselves but you know i i know that they've been looking deeply into air source uh, but it was i was really encouraged when i heard that they now also diversifying into the ground source because you know, they're, they're they're super focused laser focused on on customers yes. and what they want to be able to offer is is the best service to the customer. So the fact that they've recognised this now is, yeah. I think, a really good feather in your cap. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully that partnership will, will lead to great things as well. Yes. And then, so talking then a little bit outside of the UK. Yes. Are these sorts of systems in place in other countries? 
So it's really interesting they're starting to really be recognized. So if we look at the USA, there's now National Grid have just um, in Massachusetts is starting a first pilot of four geothermal loops. And that recognition around there needs to be something different to gas and what looks and feels like gas. And is it a geothermal loop? It's the same as a, no, it's it's a network. Same, just a different phrase. Okay. Good, good catch. Yeah. No, ne- same as a network heat pump, um, just the, the American phrase. Way of saying it. Okay. Um, um, so they're uh, also in New York. So starting to be in the US, recognizing there is a need to decarbonize homes. And in, provide cooling. And I mean, provide cooling very important in the, in the most yeah. efficient and, and consumer acceptable. Well, same in France, where we're seeing quite strong um, momentum in great influence. And then we're getting a lot of interest from areas that have maybe more traditional district heating who've realized they've hit the limits of what district heating is effective and then recognize this is the answer to you know the, the gap between air source heat pumps and district heating. So I think, you know, network heat pumps or geothermal loops are not yet on the global radar, but we're seeing all of those early signs about the recognition about we've got a a housing or a building stock we need to decarbonize and we're looking for a solution to fit that. And network heat pumps are the answer. So really, you know, UK is your focus, but there's nothing to stop your manufacturing business scaling out into other markets? No, I, I mean, so net manufacturing business, actually that expertise, we're the expert in that borehole to radiator. Mm-hmm. And that is gives mm-hmm. us, I think, something really important around we can provide confidence and comfort to the home. Um, yes. So that system expertise is also really important to us as well as the manufacturing. Very good. And you've got an engineering background, haven't you? Which is yes. why you're able to speak so eloquently about this so topic. I, I do. So I am an engineer. Um, and I, although I describe myself as I know enough to be dangerous, but not enough to be useful. So uh, <laughs> I tell my team, you don't want me designing, you certainly don't want me installing heat pumps. But I think that ability to understand the engineering behind it, energy systems, but then also bring the partnership and the business and commercial and, and put it together. And that's what makes it such an incredible company and such an incredible role. Well, so and that's what makes you perfect for this this new phase, I think. So Tamsin, tell me a little bit about what it's like to be a, a female leader in this space, because energy is quite traditionally dominated you know, by our male colleagues. Yes. So, I mean, the first thing I have to say is I, I think of myself as a leader rather than a female leader. But then when, you know, you prompt me and I think about it, I, a couple of things. So when I was 10, I wrote in my primary six, so a, a sort of um, what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a leader of an engineering business in the future. Wow. Along that's quite with, unusual. <laughs> you know, along with I like lasagna and didn't like my brother. You know that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so quite unusual. Um, and then, you know, various things, I was encouraged at school to study engineering, which if we think about the north of Scotland in the 1990s, it's pretty, pretty unusual. And then again, you know, I was always interested in how, you know, businesses worked, how to things got done. You know, just I always was volunteering for, you know, additional things, but also then was given a number of really critical where people gave me quite stretching roles. In, but when you went to university, did yeah. you study engineering? I studied engineering. And were you the only woman on the course or how, what was the balance? No, so on the course at the time, I think it was about 20% women. Okay. Um, I was made, I mean, I had made great friends across the engineering, but one in particular, really close friend where we kind of spurred each other on and encouraged and supported each other. Um, so that was very important to both of us at the time. We used to try and catch each other out about how, you know, engineering uh, exam questions. Um, so it's engineering. Um, so I think I've always been used to being, you know, one of a minority, quite often the only woman in the room. At one point, I realized I stopped noticing it. Um, things that have been important to me, actually recognizing it's OK to be a, be a woman, the importance of networks, sponsorship and, and actually the we can bring often, you know, have a particular style that may be different, but actually can bring the best. Out of it. I don't need to know all the answers, but I do like to set, you know, create brilliant teams who do things we never thought we could do. Mm. Um, and you mentioned sponsorship there. So yeah. did you have female mentors or, or female other leaders that you... Did? Yes. And I think, you know, that's something that, that where, as I came up through my career, there weren't very many female leaders. And actually... 
one of the people in my network now is one of my old bosses, Heidi Mottran, who's a, a CEO. And I phone Heidi and say, Heidi, you know, can I go? Well, I've got this phrase, I go, what would, what would Heidi do? You know, we have this, <laughs> what would Madonna do in the 90s? What would Heidi do? So I do think that's really important. And, and I probably didn't have so many of those role models as I came through my career. I think it's very important for people to have role models. Um, but I did have some very great sponsors who gave me opportunities to move into frontline roles. I came back from maternity leave and the CEO of the business I worked for gave me up. Uh, I took on a role running a really big operation. So again, that willingness for people to take, you know, informed risks um, and give those roles. And I think there are some things for any women listening about the importance of operational roles and PL roles mm. and finding opportunities to get those skills. You know, those have been absolutely critical for me to have the skills to do the job I do today. Yeah. And so in Kenza then, uh, is it, you know, engineering companies tend to be slightly weighted, but have you got sort of female so, leaders that you're nurturing? So uh, absolutely, absolutely. And we had um, women in science and engineering day recently Actually, we've got it's about a third of the company is women. Mm. No, we've got more to do, and we absolutely want to nurture women and and people from you know all kinds of different you know, to get maximised cognitive diversity. But that was you know that I think there's something again about the the culture of the company about the authentic leadership has allowed women to mm. thrive and develop within the company. Mm. Very. Um, I mean, this is not credit to my male counterparts. Yeah, well, and this is in no way at all criticism. You know, it's it's just about the balance, isn't it? And the and the fact that, as you say, the diversity. Because often, you know, house at a household level, often it's the perhaps the woman who's actually doing the budgeting or making some important decisions. Um, but they perhaps defer. You know, don't don't consider it's energy is something they should think about. But you know, having a female leader in this space, I think, actually does help kind of the profile of this issue kind of reach the important decision makers that are out there. Absolutely. And then finally, just when we sort of thinking about what people, you know, we've got a broad listenership to this uh, podcast and um, I'm just what the messages that you would most like to convey about the sort of next 12 months in Ken's journey. Well, they say the most important message for, um, I want to convey at the moment is a world of decarbonizing heat without network heat pumps is going to be more expensive and less fair for consumers. And so that importance of getting network heat pumps on the radar of government policymakers is really important. The next thing that's really important for us is then how do we scale with these opportunities as we're looking at more of electrification of heat? and finally is honing our business models. But I think it really is that first one. Mm. A world of decarbonisation heat without network heat pumps is more expensive and less fair for consumers. So that's, that's, just, that's a sort of, if I could, yeah. uh, my, well, my T-shirt logo. Yeah, or the positive, which is it's cheaper and warmer. Che- you know, che- 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 cheaper yeah. cheaper and fairer. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. And are there places, so, you know, people... I hope people listening to this are you know, persuaded by the physics and, the, and the, the economics, but actually seeing something in action is sometimes the thing that tips people into, oh, right now, you know, I can see this. So if, if people want to do visits or they want to see examples of your projects, yes, is that absolutely. possible? We, I mean, we have projects all across the UK. We've got a number of great case studies on our website, um, whether it's from St. Stephen's Heat the Streets, where it is, you know, this is this is decarbon this, the pilot of decarb mass decarbonisation, tower blocks in Thorock, um, fire stations in Northumberland, um, housing in Scotland. So a range of things across the UK. Now, the other thing that's going to be very boring for people to come and see a project that's done because everything's beneath the ground, and there's a white box in a cupboard providing efficient, reliable heat. Um, but yes, but there that's are many as we said at the start. Sometimes that's exactly what we want. Boring is good. Boring is good. Yeah, excellent. And obviously, there's a play on words there because boring, as in going into the ground, is also what you do. And that, is that actually though um, thinking about possible constraints? Is the is there a bit of a, uh, a kind of bottleneck with regard to the the actual drilling? Because these are relatively big kit pieces of kit, aren't they? 
Yes. Um, so the, the drilling, there is, I mean, today there's more capacity than, than demand in the UK. As we scale massively, this is an area we're really looking at how do we support the drilling industry to scale. The drill rigs range in size, but I mean, if we think about them as like a, a, a one in a kind of a, a sort of a big SUV size. Oh, okay. So they can come into the one I saw yesterday, um, come into a street, you know, not too disruptive. So they're, they're not kind of uh, what we think of as sort of, you know, US fracking drill mm-hmm. rig scale. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. And that would do an average size, you know, you just need so one of these vehicles to do the two big drills down. So this is it. So it's one drill round, size of a dinner plate that mm-hmm. goes down 200 to 300 meters. Okay. Um, and it, you know, it is the size of a dinner plate. So hopefully this is a street scene that will become more common, right? Yeah. That, that instead of the sort of, you know, we're all used to the sort of, you know, digging up the tarmac and the laying of fiber optics, but hopefully over time, more and more communities are going to get excited about the idea that they're sort of drilling into the latent heat and cool cooling that's there under their feet. And then it's helping them have a, you know, a warmer lifestyle, a cooler lifestyle yeah. and save money on bills. So this and is, save money on bills um, yeah. and, and a reliable uh, yeah, heating source in the depths of winter. And those smart entrepreneurs should be thinking about those service providers and maybe boosting the capacity into those yeah. drilling companies and service yeah. providers. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Tamsin, it's been a real pleasure meeting you. Thank, thanks for coming into London. I hope we'll see you in London a lot yes. more in, in, your, in your new uh, capacity of raising the flag for this really important technology. Um, really delighted to, to meet you and looking forward to hearing of the future exploits of, of Kenza and all your partners. Thank you. Thank you. So that was Tamsin Lishman. To me, Kenza's solution offers some pretty fundamental advantages over others being promoted. It's inherently super efficient, helping to reduce rather than increase our overall energy demand. It carries no risk of dangerous explosions and health impacts from combustion gases. And by signing up half the customers on the street, allowing others to join when ready, you get an economy of scale without forcing change on people who are not yet ready. What's not to like? As ever, we'll provide relevant links in the show notes and the YouTube channel will provide some visual illustrations of what we talked about. But as Tamsin said, it's kind of boring. But that's probably exactly what we need. More boring, boring to tap into the free heat under our feet. And just for disclosure, last year, EcoPragma Capital, of which Michael is co-managing partner, helped Kenza to raise £70 million from investors. Thanks to Kenza's Thomas Roberto and Richard Warren for the help in setting things up to Eliza Tewson and Zach Zabon for their production support, and thanks to you for listening. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to Cleaning Up, or leave us a review on your favourite podcast platform. And do please spread the word. Tell your friends and colleagues. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, sign up for our free newsletter on the publishing platform Substack at mlcleaningup.substack.com. That's mlcleaningup.substack.com or visit us on cleaningup.live. That's cleaningup.live.